thank you, and uh, good evening, afternoon. Um, I should say, one of my favorite things about uh, hanging with my colleagues in an archaeological setting conference is I want to know, how did you get into archaeology? There's always a story. And it starts very early, it starts very late, um, you find something, you can't let it go. And to get to where my talk starts, I need to tell you a bit about why and how I got to a particular question. <clears throat> so my passion for archaeology is lifelong. Um, if you buy me a beer, I'll tell you about it, but it mainly involves Sesame Street at age three. Um, but this is my beloved. I work with the Maya in Central America, so to put you into context, um, the big dot on the top map is more or less the area of Calcmul. Calcmul is one of the largest sites in the Americas. Um, certainly one of the largest sites for the Maya. It's classic periods, so somewhere between 250 AD to approximately 800 AD, it was a very mighty site. Um, this is my beloved temple too, which is so large that you cannot take a picture of it from the ground. And even if the trees were not there, you can't see the whole structure, so that's taken from a helicopter. Um, so this is my passion. These people, this, this culture, this incredibly rich tradition and piecing it back together because um, the histories of the Americas are, are somewhat problematic just in the way that the conquest happened, the materials that were destroyed, and uh, the disconnection that the people experienced with their own history. <clears throat> so uh, initially I started out as an epigrapher, a linguist, um, combination with archaeology, and uh, I studied the vessels at the top. These are cylinder vessels. They have quite a range in size. So some of them are quite small, like a small cup. Um, some of them are actually quite big. And the text around the top, top says something approximate to, this is the drinking vessel for chocolate, or this is the drinking vessel for some kind of maize beer. And um, so that's the glyphs at the top. I don't know if you can see the tiny little arrow it's pointing to one of the glyphs, and that reads cacao, chocolate, or um, anyway, some processing of chocolate. So it's cup-shaped. Um, in a residue study in the 1980s, they found theobromine and theophylline, which are two of the biomarkers for chocolate. So it stands to reason it's cup-shaped. It says this is the drinking vessel for chocolate. We found the residues. Et voila, there you go, right? So all cups that say chocolate are therefore chocolate vessels. Um, there's a small problem, which is that as I was studying the text, I wanted the empirical evidence. Tell me that they held chocolate. Show me that they held chocolate. And uh, the more I read about the cylinders, I found that every study that had analyzed any of these cylinders had not found chocolate in them. Other things, yes. In bowls, yes. On plates, yes. On undecorated cylinders, yes. But never in the ones that actually say chocolate. Why not? So um, now I'm into my second doctorate in analytical chemistry to learn more. But what I can tell you is that I've now handled over 100 of these, some of them coming directly out of the dirt, some of them in museums, um, some in private collections. I've used a number of methods for analyses, mainly GCMS, um, but I haven't found it. I haven't found it in any of them. So there's a problem, there's a disconnect. And uh, why? What is the, the, the mechanism here? And to understand the people, to understand these beautiful ceramics that show up with the kings in the, the courtly picture, so the drawings, the murals. We see the king sitting on his throne. He's got his um, accoutrements, and he's got one of these cylinders sitting on the throne with him. It's a symbol of authority. It's extremely important to their, their understanding of kingship. <coughs> Excuse me. So in the process of looking at vessels that were tagged with food text, um, I was under the belief that they operated very much like the rest of the world, which is that we have lots of things that are labeled with food text that we do not use to hold that particular food. So I have a coffee cup on my desk that has pencils in it. I have uh, a beer mug that my kids drink chocolate milk out of. You know, we don't necessarily perform that way. In our own cultures, why on earth would we expect people a thousand years ago to have behaved any less human? So in my process, um, let me get to the next slide here. There's actually only two that have tested positive for the, the substance that they say in the text. So the first one is um, the famous Rio Azul lock top vessel. 
And this is the one where they found the theobromium theophylline, but it is not a drinking vessel. It's a storage vessel. It's actually quite extraordinary. It's got a, a top that fits on quite snug, and that's what had the theobromine in it, but it is a storage vessel. It's very thick. Um, and the second one I found during my dissertation, which is, uh, it had tobacco in it, and it says the glyph that's on the front there is umai, which means tobacco. On the other side, it says yoto, the house of his or her tobacco. So that's only two. In this entire time of residue analysis for the Maya, which has been since the 1980s, those are the only two confirmations we have that conform with the text. So we've got a mismatch of understanding. But if you review the research or look at the literature, people have run wild. There's uh, beautiful museum exhibits. There's TV specials, there's shows, there's movies, and so forth, that are all talking about these performing as chocolate vessels, the, the cylinders, that the Maya wrote and contained exactly what they said in their text, and that, that's not conforming to what we're finding empirically. <coughs> Excuse me. So what else are we assuming? We always assume that we're taking every cup out of the ground, it held what it said. What are we missing? What significant behaviors are there? So I'm, I'm going to um, cut you to the end of my dissertation, which is that I believe what they were holding was dry chocolate. Okay, so anyway, they're taking out a measure of chocolate, pulverizing it, adding it to a liquid, which you can't drink that chocolate unless you add it to something that's actually quite bitter and oily. But that's where we find the residues is in the, the secondary vessels. But um, <coughs> what else aren't we looking for? What else aren't we seeing that's in the archaeological record? And there's a lot because we're overlooking classes of vessels. We're, we're misunderstanding and running wild with these interpretations. <clears throat> so now moving forward into the process of evaluation, which is that the other thing that we're missing is that the majority of the projects that can afford residue analysis or have people on staff that can perform the residue analysis are these major sites, so where you have the pyramids. And not all of them do the residue analysis but a good majority, and that's where we get the data from. But this is where the kings and the queens live. These are big center nodes of behavior. So, <clears throat> excuse me, we're not looking at what actual behavior exists for all of the other sites to connect. And, <clears throat> excuse me, the subset up to the side is all the secondary sites, all the satellite sites. And most of these are um, settled by the king's sons, the king's daughters that are not direct line to the, the throne itself. So we have all these petty nobles, we have these second nobles and so forth that are taking the ritual experience, their ritual performance to these secondary sites. Okay, so the nature of my talk is, well, where do we look for this information? Because most of those other sites, those secondary sites, and there are, there's literally thousands of them. We just don't have enough archeologists, we don't have enough hours, we don't have enough funding to address all of those sites. But what we do have is billions of artifacts that are stored in museums. Just incredible um, deposits that are there and they're just languishing. They're just sitting there. They're, no one's doing anything with them. So these probably look familiar to you in one way or another. And you've probably contributed, as I have, to um, these things that are being stored. This is where we need to look. I am a resident at Yale University working with a collection. This is actually, it's very extraordinary. It was collected by uh, Maximilian. And when he was assassinated, uh, his doctor, well, Juarez's doctor, the confirmed Maximilian's um, death, was living in Troy, New York. And so as a gift, he was given a portion of what Maximilian had amassed in Mexico. And these things were shipped to Yale University. And because they're not beautiful, because they're not the, the most exquisite pieces, they weren't conserved, they weren't even thought of. They were stuck in drawers, they were left in boxes, they were pushed away for 150 years. They were left dirty. <clears throat> so this is a, a picture actually of me sitting in the uh, Peabody Museum analyzing some of these materials. As I was going through the notes, as I was looking at what was in the Peabody Museum and now in the Wardle Center, is that there are all of these intervening sites, all these tiny secondary sites that link Colic Mole to the next major center. And through time, there's where we should be looking. How did ritual move? 
who was doing what, how did it change through time. The residues that we need to be looking at, that we can look at, are all right there. They're in these museum collections. Put it to use. Okay, so we're gonna skip to the chase. I know the problems, as does anybody who's ever dealt with residue analysis. You already have all the contamination of the field. You've got the natural problems of, of the rain that's fallen on it, the wind, the, the critters that have come in contact with it. Then you have the issue of the archeologist and the field hands that have excavated the material. So I have found bug spray, I found suntan lotion, <clears throat> you name it. All of this you know, sweat falls into these vessels. So the contamination just in general is problematic in the best of circumstances. Wow, but really? Okay, um, so that's problem number one, but now that they've gone to the museum, we have a second layer of problems, which is they've been conserved, they've been washed, they've been handled multiple times, they've been stored in drawers that are made of who knows what, they've been in plastics, they've been in tin, they've been in paper. So the layers of, of contamination are increased. I am aware of that. Um, <clears throat> in our best case scenario, this is freshly out of the dirt, I get my hands on it before anybody does anything to it, the best that we've got is somewhere between 17 and 20% success rate. So that's not how to begin with. Um, but our methods are vastly increasing and they're going really quite quickly into um, new realms. I've had success with museum collections. It is possible. It's entirely possible. Um, but what we don't have is we don't have a great range of things to teach students to um, that have been published as successful for a wider range of materials. Um, excuse me. So there are a number of, and I've got some of them listed here as, as they were hitting me, um, promote it to students, but they, museums also have funding. And a lot of museums, in fact, have trouble giving that funding away. Um, the Library of Congress was having trouble having people apply for their Kislev Fellowship. Really well funded, lots of materials, but no one was applying. It's a new place for us to look. The materials are on hand. But another wonderful thing about it is, is that they are adopting more um, technologies into museums. So Raman spectroscopy, for instance. Most museums, now major museums, have Raman in-house. Well, traditionally it's been used for inorganic analyses. So what are the pigments in the, the paste or in the, um, the colors and the, the um, textiles and so forth? You can identify all these compounds with Raman spec. It's not a difficult machine to use. But it hasn't really been used for organic analyses. And the reason why is that um, there's a lot of background noise. There are a lot of things that are fluorescent. And the wonderful thing about Raman is, is that it's non-destructive. It will not damage the ceramic. Other analyses can be performed. You need the tiniest amount, just a few grains of sand, really, to look at. Um, but that is entirely possible. And with, at least for American ceramics, most of the Americas through time, is that they have these deep pores. They're pottery, they're not ceramic, which means that things get washed into those pores. They get encased. Bacteria makes these perfect little seals around all this wonderful material. And you can pick the pores, take out the sample, and look at that under Raman, which is part of my dissertation research right now. The other thing is, is that we need to work more with forensic studies with, um, and the group that I'm working for right now at SUNY Albany is looking at what can they take out of the soils? What can they take to identify human interaction with environment or um, burials and so forth? So there's new areas that we should be wrapping our mind around in terms of talking about how do we get the empirical evidence to talk and discuss and get to actual behavior. So I am not going to go through Rowan, which I would love to, but um, if you have any questions about that, I'm going to certainly tell you um, after the talk. But Raman is and has some wonderful aspects to it that should be considered by everyone in this room. If you have students, introduce it to them. But we need to adopt more of these technologies and um, encourage encourage the, the looking into them to apply so we can get the empirical data, so we can get the range of behaviors, so we can get the interactions of behaviors. One minute. Okay. Um, anyway, but thank you very much for your attention. 
please consider the, the museums, their funding, their opportunities, but also to consider what it is that we're digging up, storing, and not revisiting, that those may be those important nodes of confirming how things are moving, how behaviors are moving, how rituals are changing over time, how they're performed in these secondary areas and tertiary areas. Um, thank you. Thank you.